Even worse, you a Purvis Ellis. You worthless fella. Purvis Ellis. Purvis Ellis. You worthless. Ding ding. I holla. Purvis Ellison, born April 3rd, 1967. Was Purvis Ellison the worst number one draft pick of all time? If you poll this question, you would get more than a few that think he was, and to the rest, he's at least top 10. But was Ellison really that bad? If you ask Jay-Z, he was worthless. But how worthless can a guy be and still be selected first overall at the highest level of basketball, right? But there lies the confusion, and also the best examples of how things like hindsight, circumstance, fit, genetics, and opportunity can't be certain before a guy is taken with such an important pick. He could be highly attractive at the level he's leaving for numerous reasons, could have perfect size and confidence, pedigree, accolades, but until you get that guy in your locker room, there's really no telling how things will translate. It's one of the beauties and ugliness of the game. Beauty for the fans because it's thrilling almost not to be sure. Like gambling in a way. You can't convince a thrill seeker not to risk throwing it all away just for that very short lasting feeling of taking a chance and winning. Also it gives fans hope, faith in the unknown. Since religion is synonymous to our existence, we have proof that humans enjoy that type of thing. But for the player that also has those unsure thoughts, they are the ones having to live with being considered a disappointment for the rest of their lives. Will they all care? Of course not. They're older now, with kids and a family, and most of them have made a lot of money being a disappointing top pick. The 1989 NBA Draft is often considered the worst draft of all time. Of the top 10 selections, you'd be hard pressed to remember any of those names outside of sharpshooter and NBA All-Star Glenn Rice. Ellison was selected before Rice and 10 All-Stars in total, along with two Naismith Basketball Hall of Famers by the Sacramento Kings. They expected him to come in and be much like he was in college. Instant impact player that could rebound and block shots at a high level. His lack of size was obviously not factored in as the Kings saw a vision of the future in slender bigs that could still compete. Obviously, in 1989, the game was ways away from that being the case. He won a national championship in his first year in college against number one seeded Duke, carrying the team on his back against Johnny Dawkins' Blue Devils, scoring 25 points and 11 rebounds on his way to being named the tournament's most outstanding player. He even had an NBA season, averaging a double-double at 20 points a game and 11 rebounds. Not something most number one picks in consideration can say. In my opinion, he wasn't the worst number one pick of all time. But he did have three huge reasons his growth was stunted, leading many to feel that way. Let's talk about it. It's your boy JC Stunted Growth. Let's get it, man. Purvis Ellison was a 6'9 center from Savannah, Georgia, and was a star for Savannah High School. He became a McDonald's All-American by his senior year and was rated a top three recruit in his class. Louisville were the lucky program that landed Ellison and weren't at all disappointed with the freshman who helped lead them to their second ever championship. He was the first freshman named the most valuable player of the NCAA tournament since Arnie Farron did it in 1944. He went on to become a three-time all-conference player as well as the Metro Conference Co-Player of the Year and a consensus first-team All-American in 1989. Sacramento drafted him first overall in the first televised NBA draft along with the first draft that used the two-round format we see today. Stunt number one, did Ellison know something everyone else didn't? Injuries, the number one killer of not only number one picks, but athletes in general. It's one of those hidden circumstances you can anticipate a player struggling with when you invest in them on draft night. Or can you? 
Maybe now it's a lot easier with the advancements in the health field, but in 1989, it was much more difficult. After re-watching the 1989 NBA draft, specifically the drafting of Purvis Ellison, you could almost feel maybe he didn't want to be drafted as the top pick. Top picks have lofty expectations. Maybe he didn't think he was ready. Or maybe he just didn't want to play for Sacramento. Or just maybe he knew health-wise he couldn't live up to what is expected of a player you essentially say is the best in the draft. The look on his face and his entire presence spoke a player that was unsure of himself. Of course, that's just speculation. What makes the argument easier is in hindsight, Ellison was holding back details of his health that just may have caused the Kings to go in a different direction. And that was that he's been having knee issues since his sophomore year in college. A discomfort he managed in his four years and one that changed the course of his career. Injury has played the biggest role in the disappointment of Purvis Ellison. From cartilage damage in both knees that required surgeries to remove bits and pieces over time, to eventually he was bone on bone. To thumb injuries, groin, bone spurs in his foot, ankle injuries, to a mysterious table landing on his toe while moving furniture at home that ended his 96-97 season. In his rookie year, he re-injured his knee and missed half the season, causing the Kings to take an early rain check on his future and trading him before the start of his second season. Injuries became kindred to Purvis Ellison, who in 11 seasons played more than 70 games just once. Danny Ainge would famously refer to him as out of service Purvis after missing so much time with random injuries. His body was obviously not built for a high level like the NBA, and because of this, he's considered one of the worst number one picks of all time. Stunt number two should have never been taken number one. This leads to the opinion Purvis Ellison was never supposed to be the number one pick in the first place. Along with keeping valuable information from the NBA about his knee discomfort in college, Ellison didn't seem to have the right mindset that could make a number one pick successful. I feel the same way about Markel Fultz when he was taken number one in a perfect situation by Philly in 2017. Fultz, to me, didn't believe he was a number one pick. His attitude during the process that was highly televised with social media and YouTube just didn't sell it for me. Even when he got hurt and couldn't play as a rookie, he always seemed almost too immature. Like Bambi being asked to run with the Bucks. He didn't have that confidence and air a player that believes he's the best has around them. Ellison seemed the same way, but maybe for a different reason, one we spoke on earlier. Not everyone is mentally built to be number one or at the front of the pack and mentally evaluating players with specific questions and studies can be helpful to the NBA if done right by the right people. So if not Purvis, then who? Sean Kemp, the biggest name in the draft in hindsight, but a guy that was kicked out of Kentucky for allegedly stealing jewelry, transferring to a community college and never played a single college game? Undersized Tim Hardaway, one-dimensional Glenn Rice, Duke portrait Danny Ferry, unknown Vladi Divac. The 89 draft was horrible and Purvis seemed like a safe choice. But had he been taken a lot later, maybe mentally it would have helped take the pressure off. Stunt number three, undersized big. I think the worst thing in the NBA is an undersized big man. Undersize in general isn't attractive, but you still see success stories of guards that have great careers being undersized, or wing players that still do great things, even power forwards with enough athletic ability become high-level players in the league. But undersized centers don't pan out very often, especially in the 90s. Ellison learned that immediately, as he was often pushed out of position in the post and without athleticism to counter him being just 6'9", he struggled outside the few years in Washington, where they were one of the worst teams in the league and had no other option than to throw it inside. 
no athleticism, undersized for the position, and injuries that further flattened him, Ellison physically was just not a great pick. After his years with the Wizards, where he won the Most Improved Player Award in 92, he was released by the team in 94 and signed with the Celtics, where he had an injury-plagued four seasons and missed the entire 98-99 season due to injury. He'd finish his career playing nine games with the Sonics in 2000-2001. All in all, Purvis Ellison was not worthless like Jay-Z says and he was surely not the worst pick of all time, and you guys said that. But he was undersized, taken way too early, and physically not fit for the NBA. But he played 11 seasons and won at least one individual award in the league in a 2010 season. Kwame can't say that, nor can Anthony Bennett or Michael Olawakandi. He went on to coach basketball and I'm sure is fine with how life turned out, but for these reasons, he is at least considered one of the worst number one picks of all time and his growth was stunted. It's your boy JC Stunted Growth and I'm out.